Hi, everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of Disruption Talks. Just recently, we noticed that actually it's above the 30th episode that we've reached. So just wanted to thank everybody involved so far. But other than that, I wanted to tell you that with each episode, I am I am learning because I have to prepare myself. I have to do something called research. I have to understand the questions that I'm asking. But with some topics, and it might not be that much of a challenge to invite a speaker who's smarter than me, but with this topic, which concerns the compliance in finance, this is an episode where I will learn as much as everybody in the audience listening to the answers. Because when you think of things like KYC or AML, of course, these are abbreviations that all of us heard one way or another, perhaps in the news, perhaps in our daily life of work. But still, I think there's a lot to be discovered in terms of that. So joining us today is none the other but Arshi. Arshi Singh, the head of product at Comply Advantage. Hi, Arshi. Hi. Hi, Philip. Hey, everyone. It's, it's good to be back talking to, to Disruption Talks. Yeah, yeah. This isn't your first interaction with disruption, is it? Uh, no, the second, but the first virtual, virtual one. First virtual. Here's crossing the fingers genuinely to being able to do that once again on, on, on actual land with an actual handshake, right? So um, what we usually begin with is a, is a short personal introduction, slightly mixed in with how what does a day in the life of, uh, in this case, head of product look like? So perhaps just before that, uh, elevator pitch of Comply Advantage, what are we looking at? What's, what's the story there? Uh, so Comply Advantage, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, in the reg tech space. Um, I'd say we, we split them into you know, a data provider for compliance purposes, a provider of, um, of information uh, about individuals or companies uh, across the world. Uh, what we are building is a, is a connected database um, and then building some solutions that help uh, solve financial crime. Um, solutions like you mentioned, KYC, um, you know, onboarding or transaction monitoring, uh, transaction screening. Okay. So I'm going to question you more and more on that later down the line. But uh, now back to the short personal introduction, if we could begin of... Arshi, and then Arshi as the head of product at Comply Advantage. Um, sure. So I, I have uh, you know 17, 18 years of experience, and if I if I had to break down my experience, I can easily chunk you know break it into three different sections. Uh, the first section being technology. Um, I started you know as a software developer uh, back in India, um, and then the second section would be uh, finance exclusively. So you know that's when I uh, moved to the US, went to business school, and and started working in corporate finance, FPNA, MNA, corporate treasury, um, you know, exclusive finance things. And then, sorry, uh, you just mentioned MNA. That one I know, but the one before FBNA, what was uh, that? Financial planning and an analysis. So that's okay. the your quarterly reporting, the quarterly cycle at public companies where you uh, you know talk about your earnings, profit loss. Okay. Um, so, so hardcore corporate finance work, then mergers and acquisitions and treasury. Um, and that sort of uh, eventually, you know, I've moved into the third section of my career, which is at this point is the longest uh, one, about seven, eight years. And that's where both these finance and technology merge together into fintech. Um, so, so yeah, fintech is, you know, it feels like home to me. I've worked both at uh, large institutions, large banks like JP Morgan Chase, um, as well as um, startup and scale up stage companies. Um, so prior to this, I was uh, at Currency Cloud, that, which is in the cross border payment space. And having worked in um, in fintech, um, you know, as as a money transmitter, I was very closely, uh, you know, uh, working with compliance because uh, it is a heavily regulated industry when you're moving money around uh, or across the globe or converting currencies. Uh, and so, yeah, always exposed to the world of compliance and how we, uh, you know, understand our customers, do the KYC, know your customer, know your business, uh, how we do the sanction screening um, and how we, you know, do the monitoring. 
And that's essentially what led me to, to comply advantage now. Um, and to answer your, your second question around my current role as the, the head of product for uh, one of our, our business lines, which is transaction monitoring and screening line of business, uh, my role is, is essentially figuring out how we unleash the power of technology to solve this financial crime. Um, you know, using artificial intelligence or machine learning, bringing the, the usage of more sophisticated technology uh, and applying it not just to, uh, to you know, make money for ourselves, that's always a, a good thing for the company, uh, but also for a, for a good cause. You know, we were catching bad guys, we're, we're solving this problem of crime or funding of terrorism or human trafficking. Um, so there's a bigger cause. And I think that that's what's really exciting about this line of business and keeps me motivated. Okay. If you can share some stories later in the interview, I would love to hear something about those uh, those more uh, action movie like elements that you mentioned, like crime or or such. But um, I, just like you mentioned, fintech is sort of inevitable. You cannot really escape it. I think there was a blog post and a podcast by A16Z, the the Horowitz Fund, that uh, every company is bound to be a fintech eventually. So. I think that that's just going to be the common denominator of any company that is digital, i.e. any company, uh, especially that with the, the, the problem that you're solving is a, is a difficult one because many a times we see technology being able to transgress the problems of before. But here, was we have growth at scale, just like cybersecurity is experiencing a boom because the more developed technologies we treasure in our day-to-day -day lives, the more exposed we are to risk. And likewise here, the more ways we find to transfer money, share money, invest money, especially with cryptocurrencies as well, the trend is that, you know, it's like a hydra from the Greek mythology. You cut off one head and then you have three coming up, right? So there's a, a lot of things to consider both on the execution side as well as the sort of customer friction element, right? So really interesting topic. And if you could tell me, how is Comply Advantage different from the rest of the industry? Because to uh, complete technological ignorance, perhaps I shouldn't be saying this working at an IT company, but I mean the actual technological expertise when it comes to developing things like what you are doing. How exactly does it differ? For me, I hear all the letters, all the abbreviations. I am slightly lost. Help me find my way. Comply Advantage covers uh, two sides of that spectrum, right? So the first uh, problem, when we talk about, uh, you know, what we hear from our customers, the problem uh, that are uh, usually our, our customers, the target uh, ones for us are the compliance officers at fintech companies. Um, and they are, they are struggling with uh, keeping up with, the, you know, the constant pressure from the regulators. Uh, of solving, uh, you know, of, of uh, staying on top of the different regulations, and each jurisdiction across the globe uh, would have their own set set of uh, requirements. Um, so the compliance officer who are uh, liable for that, and they can go to jail if if you know they don't comply with uh, if the regulators catch them not complying with this. Uh, they're constantly having to balance, uh, you know, this pressure uh, with the pressure pressure internally coming from the business, which is around growth. Uh, you know the commercial teams and the business wants to grow faster. They want to serve, uh, you know, more more customers or more segments or newer business models. Um, and so we are really trying to solve for um, the problem of that compliance officer, make their lives easier. Um, and how we do that? Like I was saying, there's there's two pronged uh, uh, approach here. The first is around giving the right data. Because if you want to um, do all these sophisticated things, you know, understand who your customer is or do some sanction screening, uh, you need to have access to good quality data. Um, it, it has to be wide ranging data. Uh, you know, if you're talking about the global, global business in today's world, every company is connected. They're doing business with other uh, parties across the globe. Um, there's a lot of cross-border, um, you know, commerce going on. Um, and so you can't just have you know data concentrated in a certain geography or just from the developed part of the world. Uh, you have to have wide ranging data that covers all economies, emerging markets, uh, you know all countries, different languages, um, and then also the timeliness of that data. Um, so you know while 
uh, to your question around how comply advantage is different, um, I would say that you know while uh, there may be other larger incumbent uh, players in our space in the reg tech space who do cover um, a lot of data and have access to you know uh, data from different geographies. Um, however, how are they making it accessible? Um, you know the the usage of technology, the the uh, the APIs that we enable, and the timeliness of of this data refresh that we do within, say, for example, sanctions data, which is published by uh, different governments or regulators across across the globe. Uh, you know that data is something that we refresh within minutes. So let's say that new uh, bad actor was identified by the US and got added to the list. Within minutes, we would have it in, and we would start screening and giving the results to our clients uh, based on that. Um, so I think often that gets ignored. The coverage of data is, is highlighted, but the frequency of uh, you know update or the timeliness of update can make a huge difference if it's within few few minutes to within few weeks. You know, you could go for weeks or even months sometimes not having the latest uh, the you know refresh of that information um so that's where you know i think one element of our uh, competitive advantage comes from because we are pretty much the first global uh, company that's building this connected database of of people and companies uh, across across the world and then the second uh, element is what do you do with that you know data if you have good quality data uh, to use it you package it up and uh, and you know, give it to customers in tools through which they can solve this financial crime. And those tools are uh, some of the terms that you were saying before. They could be onboarding, KYC or KYB, or, you know, sanction screening or transaction monitoring. So the tools, the the UI, the front end to, to be able to do that, uh, you know, those sophisticated tools are the other thing that Comply Advantage has built on top of its underlying data. So... What I am hearing as uh, sort of this explain like I'm five kind of understanding of the topic as I uh, allowed myself at the very introduction of this interview, it's pretty much in the most layman terms, like an antivirus, like a Swiss army knife antivirus that protects against the ones who would otherwise be open to committing crime on the financial oh. spectrum. Yes, yes. So, so, so let me break that down uh, on the, uh, well, there are a lot of elements in compliance world that, uh, you know, that you can solve for fraud uh, being a key one or in general credit risk, uh, you know, assessment of credit being another one. Um, I'll focus on the on the two key areas that, you know, comply advantage is focused on. Um, and those would be in the AML uh, space. Um, so it starts with first knowing your customer. Uh, you know any any entity, and you mentioned that uh, you know soon in the future, near future, we'll see every company being a fintech company, everyone having you know embedded payments uh, within their uh, their system. Uh, when we get to that stage, you pretty much you know every company would then uh, be liable um, to comply with the the money transmission regulations, which means that you need to know uh, who you're supporting, who you're paying money. Uh, on behalf of the customer that you onboard is, uh, you know, who's that customer? What are, what exactly are they doing? And how do you make sure that, you know, the, uh, what they tell you is, is accurate? Uh, one, your customer should not be, you know, anybody who's on a sanctioned list and sanctioned lists would consist of, um, you know, various individuals that different governments want to monitor closely, could be terrorists or other, other bad actors. Um, so you, you want to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that you're not serving those types of customers. Uh, then uh, beyond that, there are also some, uh, you know, uh, politically exposed people. So these could be the the heads of different states or uh, people who have access to or are close to, uh, you know, these heads of states. Um, and and that's another set of data. The politically, uh, the, it's called the PEPs, the politically exposed person data. You can track it at different levels. So the the level one, which is Purely the head of states is easy to access, but then you have level two, level three, and the more you keep going down, it gets to more you know local level officials um, having enough data on them, and not just on the person in power, but also any related people, you know, their spouses or or friends who could have an influence on them. Um, um, so you know, being aware of uh, of those those uh, types of scenarios, and then thirdly, just uh, you know, you want to know if you're serving a certain person as a customer or 
uh, even a company, uh, you know, is there uh, is there any negative news about them? Uh, and typically, you know, compliance analysts would just go and do Google search on to figure out what what's going on. Uh, but having you know good good automated tools can make that job a lot easier for you, so that you you don't have to spend your own time and effort in doing that research. But you have these automated tools that are able to track you know billions of sources of data, multiple websites across the globe to tell you any any adverse media or any negative news about. Uh, that entity, uh, either a company or a person, and you can make an informed decision of whether you want to serve this as uh, you want to onboard them as a customer or not. Uh, so that's one part of it, onboarding the customers. Now, once you've onboarded them, uh, you also have the obligation to uh, keep monitoring the activity they're doing on an ongoing basis. Uh, so say, for example, you know, customer that you onboarded, uh, they may uh, they may be a supplier, uh, uh, you know, or making supplier payments to say China. Uh, but if suddenly, uh, you know, while monitoring that, you start seeing uh, a big trend in payments going to a new jurisdiction that wasn't originally disclosed to you, or uh, or the amount of uh, you know funds flowing to some other place uh, are suddenly shooting up, then that's something you want to watch out for. You want to monitor for these types of deviations, these trends. Because uh, they uh, they are sort of indicators that there's something suspicious happening here, um, you know. Or or I, I could give you an example of you know there is uh, uh, a simple example of some somebody who uh, called themselves as a as a marketing agency, um, and you would see uh, you know payments suddenly growing to that one beneficiary across multiple. Uh, you know, one individual across multiple customers suddenly payments you know start increasing, and are worth millions of dollars payments are uh, going into into a marketing agency. And when you dig a little further under it, uh, it essentially ends up being a porn site or or you know uh, something something that effect uh, and could lead to human uh, have human trafficking uh, behind it. Um, so so that kind of diligence is uh, something that the government and the regulators are expecting financial institutions to do. Um, now, uh, you know, and, and where they find any laps, there are huge, massive, massive fines um, that are being, you know, levied by by the regulators today. Uh, every every year, you see, uh, you know, large banks uh, being uh, being fined for lack of, uh, you know, good quality oversight on that. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, that's just to give you a flavor of, you know, what kind of uh, money laundering activity you want to track. Um, and how how the onus is on the financial institution to uh, to make sure that they are tracking this, not just tracking it, but also the requirement is then they report it to the regulators. Uh, you know, wherever they're seeing trends in, that could be suspicious, um, they are required to um, to notify um, the regulators through various formats, suspicious activity reports, and if there is any any lapse in them doing it in a timely manner. Um, and it gets caught by the regulators, and again, you know, there there uh, there uh, there could be penalties and fines uh, imposed on them. Arshi, I have to tell you, I asked for an explanation like I'm five, and it's worked so well that I actually feel like I'm five years old. I feel so young after your explanation. You've broken it down extremely well and in a very digestive manner. And actually, here's a comment that's not a question, but it is a, a shout out from Joe, who calls you a sage who says that you make total sense and who says that your previous company misses you. So uh, it's it's not my biased opinion that you have just explained this excellently. So Joe, thanks thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that kind comment. So since we've established that this is a Swiss army knife approach, uh, more or less just for this, for the sake of the next question, is there a moat? Because you mentioned incumbents, and incumbents have the benefit of size and being able to throw money at a problem and say, we already have the existing infrastructure, let's build on top of that. So you just told me how you are sort of defending against them. They just are not those steps ahead to be walking side by side with you. But what about other companies that are not from the incumbent, but more from the NEO space? Like we have NEO banks, NEO InsurTex, NEO compliance. Is there a moat? Is there a killer feature that makes sure that no one steps in the way of uh, Comply Advantage? Um, Comply Advantage, you know, we've been doing this for um, 
seven years or so now. So, uh, so yeah, I'd say you know we're in that stage where uh, we beyond the startup now in the in the scale up stage, and there are um, advantages that you have. Uh, you know, being a, a younger, more agile uh, company, uh, you would uh, be able to move faster uh, than some of the incumbents. Uh, just the fact that you know your your tech stack isn't uh, is 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 newer. Uh, you're not burdened with legacy infrastructure, um, legacy systems. Um, that's that's a key advantage. And you know, in, in general, I mean, across any any industry, uh, you know, fintech or, or a tech would have that over the incumbents. Um, where uh, I think the, where uh, we are slowly, gradually making of uh, space is in the branding. You know, being uh, having having an equal voice, um, having a brand that is uh, recognized, and that. You know, as our customers are growing themselves, and as we uh, also win more and more of tier one customers, uh, I think that that will happen automatically. Uh, 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 but yeah, you know, and with that comes uh, uh, sort of awareness that regulators are aware of us, and they, uh, you know, they have more confidence in in the tools that we we are creating, which obviously helps our our clients as well. Uh, but then there is also constant threat of you know newer younger, newer startups coming in and doing it much faster than us. Um, so we have to strike the right balance. Uh, you know, as any company that matures, we have to make sure that what was, what technology we, we built a few years ago is keeping pace and it's uh, it's able to scale with the scale of our clients. So there's constant investment in, te in technology to make sure that we are revamping our systems, the architecture, the design to keep it scalable. Um, at the same time, we, we want to be nimble and uh, not lose out to the newer, younger uh, competition. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we have a you know, constant check, check on that. Uh, and when it comes to say what, you know, how do we stay one step ahead? It's, it's, it's just um, looking at new ways of doing these things. So like I mentioned, the usage of artificial intelligence, you know, we've incorporated that uh, into our um, adverse media um, and we've been, you know, using that machine learning to um, to to empower our um, uh, um, sort of, you know, tools on the onboarding and monitoring side. And we're constantly looking to make more and more use of that, uh, even in the transaction monitoring side, where, uh, uh, you know, just a few term little terminology from the industry, but uh, how our compliance, uh, uh, you know, customers uh, would think about uh, the problems is they want to balance the risk. But also keep it efficient. Um, so you know, balance the operational efficiency with their risk mitigation. Um, and so you know, based on whatever their say risk appetite is, if uh, if we are generating a whole bunch of um, noise around that, you know, that we we calling a whole bunch of uh, alerts. Alerts is something that you would say this is suspicious. This needs you to you know look at and review. Um, uh, and and every you know, suspicious activity, investigation of that activity's time and effort. Um, so how do we make sure that, you know, we're doing it in an, uh, in an optimum way and the most efficient way? Because uh, our, our customers, you know, they can hire, they can have a human-centric approach, but they can hire a whole army of uh, compliance analysts and they will sit and review each and every activity that we present to them um, and, you know, investigate it and close it out. Uh, but the, the, trend towards uh, in the industry sort of the where the direction where we're moving in is uh, to use more artificial intelligence so that we can reduce the work that these human uh, you know the compliance analysts have to do um, and that's uh, that's essentially taking doing you know a few few steps in the process uh, with the usage of artificial intelligence and thereby reducing the noise uh, in terms of what we raise to them if let's say we were raising a hundred different uh, suspicious, you know, things to them, we want to uh, reduce that noise and make it, you know, uh, be able to close say ninety of them um, uh, through the usage of artificial intelligence uh, and wherever regulators allow, uh, because you know different regulators treat artificial intelligence differently. Some look at it with with suspicion. Uh, wherever regulations allow, we would close them or we would help prioritize the work for the uh, for the compliance analyst and present all this you know it's all it's all about how how quickly we can assimilate the data and present it to them so that it makes their job much easier what would take an hour for them to investigate if it's presented in the right way 
uh, all the information is easy to navigate. It's all within one one crisp report. Then uh, then it reduces their work from one hour to say ten minutes, or what would take ten minutes can be done within one minute. So that's our goal, uh, and I think that's where uh, the industry may be headed. Uh, you know, a lot of newer, younger competitors we see in this space, they are focusing on that and they have a very niche focus. Um, but we want to incorporate this with the with the rest of the solution and the data that we have built in house um, so that, you know, we, we can continue to stay on top of technology, um, but also do it at scale with our more mature customers. Especially that I think what sort of positions you in this very, uh, very attractive uh, space, considering the dynamic between the incumbents is that the incumbents are titanic. They cannot just switch like that, like a jet ski. But you can. The incumbents, too young to have the holy grail that you are holding, which is the data that you have amassed. So I think that that data correct me if i'm wrong but i think that that is also something that sets you sets you those seven years that you mentioned apart uh which simply i'm i'm supposing that it cannot be uh somehow bought or overran or just outsourced the the conclusions and all of all of the uh outcomes that you have predicted thanks to that no one can sort of buy themselves that time right can they yeah, that, that's true. I mean, there's heavy investment that's already gone in, right? So there is a, a, a if somebody was a new a new player in the industry was looking to build all that in house, it would take time to you know build all it build it all together. Um, or the other option they would have is to then you know partner with someone, uh, pick not get the full data built in house. Uh, you know, use somebody like us, use the data layer from Comply Advantage and. Um, and build their own solution on top of that, but then you know it's it's not attacking the full uh, full problem holistically. They are you know picking and choosing what niche areas they they want to uh, tackle. Uh, and despite despite that, you know, despite all this, I mean, there is still uh, it's a big industry, and there is still a gap in the in the industry. Um, you know, there were the various. Um, I was reading some reports, and there are various estimates around. Um, or you know what sort of uh, 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 estimates on how much money is being laundered, um, and they they say anywhere between uh, you know eight hundred billion to two trillion uh, is being laundered uh, U.S. dollars worth is being laundered today, which is which is huge, right? It's it's a big percentage of the global GDP, almost two to five percent of uh, of the GDP, um, and and it's going undetected. So there is clearly a big gap in uh, and the in-house solutions that some of the larger uh, firms, you know, the banks are, um, have in place. There's a lot of investment they've been doing, but there's clearly something that's still not working for, for the larger, uh, you know, uh, companies in the space. And that's where I think uh, that's where there's a lot of room still for companies like us, reg tech firms to build more sophisticated solutions and, and tackle this, this real problem. And that sort of takes me to the, the next approach, the theme that I wanted to impose on us, which is the future, looking towards the future. So uh, the, the, the key challenges that you are facing right now, but also that the industry might be facing right now, because as, uh, as I understand it, I, I would see the following fronts. I would see that um, there would be a increased customer friction. Like the more meticulous the KYC is supposed to be, the more the last letter that C is sort of being uh, subjected to the meticulous, necessarily meticulous, but still uh, research and, uh, and and backing it up, the ever increasing compliance costs. Uh, am I am I am I missing something? You mentioned keeping information up to date. That's something that you already sort of checking off but what about the the the, the two the two first things that i mentioned so the ever increasing costs and the uh, friction that is at the end of the day on the person who wants to do something with their money yes yeah, so ultimately i think there there has to be a, a risk based approach to doing this um uh, right so the the cost uh, um uh, you know you have to uh, it balance uh, balance both things how how uh, and it starts with starts with say the the company uh, defining what their risk appetite is uh, 
uh, you know, any any company, a financial institution, or fintech that's in the money transmission space would would uh, in order to you know to transmit the money, they would uh, they require re- regulation and they're required by regulators to uh, uh, you know they they're given licenses by regulators and that automatically means they have to comply with with certain things. So it all starts with them defining what their compliance policies are going to be, their you know AML policies. Um, and depending on their risk appetite, you know, they can uh, classify certain geographies as, as risky, entire, uh, you know, regions as risky or certain industries at risky, as risky example, you know, like gambling, you may call that or gaming, even online gaming is a gray area. Um, some companies may even qualify, you know, crypto uh, exchanges as uh, as risky. So depending on each, you know, each company's appetite and what, you know, where they want, where they're headed, um, once they have that defined, then it's about the operational side. You know, how do you make sure that you're uh, you have the procedures, the processes in place um, that um, allow you to uh, to execute on on whatever or implement that policy that you have. Uh, uh, you know, to to do that in a in a desired manner, uh, and that's where I think the tools, uh, you know, compliance tools like us uh, come into play, because. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, like I was saying, it's it's a data problem to solve. Uh, to keep it, you know, operationally efficient, you can either have that human centric approach. So you know, keep hiring more and more compliance analysts, um, and and there are obviously cons to that approach. Um, you know, if as your company is scaling, as your volumes are growing, growing, you cannot just keep hiring uh, and scaling your compliance team uh, the same way. Uh, one, it's not cost efficient, it's not sustainable. Um, and two, uh, relying purely on on a human based approach is is also prone to, you know, it's prone to errors, it's prone to biases, no two individuals would treat the same thing the same way, or even the same individual on two different days, they might consider one thing suspicious and on another day, they might not. So there's there is that human, uh, uh, you know, anytime you do this, these sort of judgment things manually, there is that element of uh, human bias coming into play. And so the other alternative is to go the to use technology and make it more tech centric approach, in which case then, uh, you know, you use tools, sophisticated tools that uh, that either automate some of this process or at least automate the the gathering of data and the presentation of that information for the last step to be taken by by the analyst. Um, and like I was saying, you know, before, uh, if we can reduce the amount of uh, time it takes for an analyst to investigate something, and if they find it suspicious, then uh, you know the amount of time it takes for them to report that activity to the regulators. If we can reduce all this through the use of uh, artificial intelligence or uh, you know the tools, any other sophisticated tools that we uh, we're working on, then uh, you know then we've op- achieved that that. Uh, uh, our goal or our objective of uh, making sure that uh, the the human beings are invest are investing most of their time in in real activity that could uh, really help them catch catch the you know the the crimes. Um, today, a common problem in the industry is the amount of false positives that get generated. So there's there's a lot of noise being generated, and you can imagine if one person has to look at hundred different things. Uh, the amount of focus that they would be able to give them is um, is going to be a lot less as opposed to if they only have to look at, you know, five different things, then they can purely, truly investigate, uh, you know, do their full diligence on those five things and be able to to catch crime. Um, so it, it's it's about focus. And we want to take all that noise away and make sure that, you know, the, the analysts are spending most of their time on the real, real uh, activity that could be suspicious. And what you're saying makes sense because, I mean, cost inefficiency is just like a side negative effect. But the main one is what you just mentioned. Like, I don't want humans to be establishing such important things as KYC or AML. I want an algorithm. And once the algorithm says, I'm not sure. That's when I want the human to step in because just like you said, the element of human error of how I'm feeling today, of whether my breakfast was good on my stomach, all of those small things that compound that give you that margin of error. But with scale, 
that margin of error just keeps compounding with every other human being added into the mix. So absolutely, I, I completely agree with you. But now I want to jump into a topic that should be interesting for even people who are non-technical. So the crime aspect. You just told me a second ago that there is a, a significant amount, a substantial pile of cash that is not being spotted when it comes to anti money laundering so maybe i'm not getting something but on a philosophical note how do i know that which i don't know how do we know that that money has been laundered if we have allowed it to be laundered like is it some sort of survivorship bias conundrum that my brain can't figure out or how do we know what is the money that went unnoticed in order to be able to actually quantify it how much we didn't notice how does that work I don't know how they came up with these estimates. So it's a good question because unlike uh, unlike fraud, you know, uh, like fraud is easier to detect because within uh, a week or, you know, 10 days, you would know uh, the person who's been, you know, um, who's the victim would, would call out or would say that there's money from my bank account that's gone or my credit card that's gone. And you know uh, for a fact with certainty that, you know, this is the this is what was fraudulent. With uh, with money laundering, you don't have that certainty because uh, nobody's going to call and tell you in some time that uh, you know this was this was money laundering. Um, and an analyst who's who's doing this investigation, making a decision and saying, okay, maybe this is not suspicious. I'll I'll let it go. Uh, you, there is no cert, no way to know for sure that what you let go as as good um, activity was essentially bad. Um, and and the only the best evidence we have of that is when you know once in a while when uh, when the regulators catch these uh, financial institutions and they get fined um, and usually it's it's the the large ones right the larger banks that you would hear uh, more about when they get fined just I think in just in 2012 uh, so, sorry 2020 alone uh, there was 14 billion uh, worth of bank fines that you know globally different regulators. Uh, uh, applied, um, and most of these these tend to be in in the AML uh, space, anti money laundering uh, space. Some of them are also in in the KYC or or maybe data leaks, uh, you know, of personal information. Uh, but they're very heavily skewed on on anti money laundering, and um, I think that's the that's the most real hard evidence we have uh, where they have found uh, lapses in compliance or, or breaches. Uh, and and U.S. regulators tend to be you know most uh, active here. U.K. regulators as well, uh, you know European ones in Australia. It, it's the trend is catching across the globe. But yeah, historically U.S. and and U.K. regulators have been most active. Uh, in yeah, last year alone, 2020, uh, there were 12 U.S. banks: J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, uh, for various various uh, lapses. You know they they got fined. Um, what we are hearing also from uh, from our customers or uh, is that the number of uh, uh, activity suspicious activity that they are reporting to regulators that has actually increased uh, in the last one year or so since since covid times uh, so so there is uh, in general we know that the trend towards digitization increased because of uh, the pandemic um, and you know the volumes of uh, of payments or uh, even cross-border increased. Um, certain sectors less so, say travel got hit, but then there are other sectors, e-commerce, um, that really boomed. Um, so, so it's probably you know the function of more and more digitization of uh, of uh, payments and money move, moving that uh, the the amount of uh, you know suspicious activity through these channels is also is also increasing, and that's why I, that's the closest evidence uh, you know we could have of where there have been lapses. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you. Otherwise, it's it's hard to know. Uh, you know, money laundering, it's not black and white. It's not supposed to be. That's not how they make it, right? So we spoke about this. Now let's expand the spectrum. And I want to polarize this with an example. Uh, so we are living in the times of definitely new problems, perhaps not fundamentally new themes of issues, but new problems that we have not had before. 
Number one, uh, we have never had such an abundance and uh, financial maturity when it comes to cryptocurrencies to the tune where one of the richest people in the world uh, sends the, uh, the, the, the market cap of, of Bitcoin itself, just crashing with a, with a single tweet. Uh, we are living in the times where there is a ransomware group, they're called Darkside, and they uh, attack the East Pipeline, East Coast Pipeline uh, of the US. And then actually they say that they have a, a code of conduct, that they are honorable, that they would not, they apologize for actually targeting the pipeline. They say they would never target a hospital or anything that would be a very vulnerable space. So having this polarized example, I want to take it to compliance, back to compliance. So the future of financial crime, what is going to be something that I'm not even seeing today because... I could not imagine the things that I cannot foresee. What do you think is going to be the the future pirate of, uh, of financial crime? We don't know what we don't know, right? So yeah. um, I think um, there is there is just huge amounts, massive amounts of data that is being generated um, in you know today's age of information technology, and and it's it's about being able to consume that data fast enough, uh, uh, you know, we, we uh, just just on the internet there are massive, massive sources of uh, of information, new new websites and news being generated across the globe. Uh, you know, tens of thousands of of websites where uh, anywhere you know some suspicious activity or something get gets reported. And I think our as a as a um, you know, as as a, a company that wants to kill this financial crime, or you know, provide uh, best efficient tools uh, to eliminate this, our job is to is to stay on top of that and be able to consume this data as it gets reported anywhere in the world. Um, and we have hired a whole bunch of data scientists um, who are working on this problem, uh, who are looking at how we consume. Uh, you know, data from these tens of thousands of different websites um, on a daily basis, and and extract the insights out of that uh, through you know uh, sophisticated algorithms, machine learning, um, and and be able to present you know where, where any any bad news or the some of the examples that you were gi giving, if they get reported in in a local website, local paper, we should be on top of it and be able to elevate it. Um, and show it to our, you know, customer that this is something that's of alert, and ultimately it's their decision, uh, you know, how they weigh it. Uh, but what we want is is to be able to extract that and make sure one that we doing doing it accurately. Um, and you know, as you can imagine, uh, 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 when you when it comes to different languages, uh, the kind of algorithms that you use to to make sure that you know you're not uh, you're not pulling in. Uh, an incorrect name or incorrect actor. Uh, there's a, there's a whole uh, bunch of investment that we put into our screening and and matching uh, matching logic. Uh, it's it's I, I guess your your name is a good good example, right? Uh, uh, F I L I P. I mean, an alternate uh, way to spell it is P H L I P. Yeah. Um, so how do we how do we take that into account? You know, different say transliterations of uh, um, of of names like that, or or any kind of uh, 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 you know, uh, I mean, aliases uh, Bob instead of Robert, or Will instead of a uh, Bill instead of a Williams. Um, so th these are just some you know basics of of how you do this this matching. Um, it's not always an exact match. You need to have a fuzziness uh, logic, um, and constantly giving the tools to our customers to tweak this. They can you know they should be able to tune it based on. Of what they want to catch and what their um, capacity is because if they if they make it too loose then they're going to see a whole bunch of uh, noise being being generated which could you know which could then inundate them and they won't have enough capacity um, to detect all this so it's it's constantly trying to strike that right balance uh, where we don't want to create this extra noise so how do we make our algorithm more and more fine tuned so that it's really going after what you consider risky, um, and different segments have their own different definitions of what what risky is, right? So you were you were talking about 
uh, blockchain crypto um you know that obviously that's a that's a big segment in itself and uh, you know it's it's a key uh, big segment for us also um the regulations in that segment are are only you know going to increase um already i mean uh, i don't know how many uh, people uh, uh, you know understand this but there are already regulations that apply on crypto exchanges and and blockchain firms uh, in the us they are uh, the us regulator uh, considers them uh, even though you know the cryptocurrencies aren't recognized as legal currencies or legal tenders but they by the regulators uh, but they're still um, uh, considered you know equivalent to money transmitters and so all the regulations around sanction screening um, having you know aml processes procedures and reporting any suspicious act activity all those obligations apply to uh, a, a cryptocurrency or blockchain exchange um, as well um, and so uh, you know being able to do this for for this whole new growing economy um is is a key uh, you know area for us um historically we focused on the fiat uh, fiat currencies uh, but we are actively looking to incorporate even the the blockchain and the crypto side so that we can do that full end to end uh, monitoring across both fiat and the crypto world um and i think yeah with as you said you know we were seeing a whole rise in in um uh, this segment and so many companies focused on this um that regulators can't afford to uh, to ignore it uh, you know uk regulators are looking at it across the world different regulators have started focusing on specific regulations um, around this this space um there and yeah it's it's for uh, tech companies like us to ensure that we also stay on top of that and bring out uh, appropriate tools uh, to cover both sides uh, fiat and cryptocurrencies uh, I, I want to reference three things that you mentioned. My name, sure, it's diff spelled differently in Polish, in French, in in British English. Uh, it's a American Phil versus a British Philip. So uh, th there's a lot, but you know, these are differences in letters that can be figured out. But think of all the systems that don't recognize Unicode, and you have Maria versus Maria, and all of that can already be a, a, a such a small thing that even uh, even someone that's diligent might might miss that. Um, and what you mentioned about crypto. Uh, yes, especially with Uniswap, right? Because there you can create the dependency between an actual dollar and, uh, and a digital asset. So that already will be a, a new set of problems to, to unpack. But also, at the end of the day, even crypto is just as strong as the software is because the missing link is the human. As we know, with Silk Road, they were able to identify the people behind it due to their lack of diligence and being extremely cautious when dealing with their finances that were not connected to Silk Road. It's very easy, perhaps, sorry, very easy, absolutely not, but it's it's doable to connect the dots that are not exactly connected to what you are doing in the sort of shielded blockchain or crypto space. If you make a mistake, that's a simple social engineering feat for anybody who's on the investigative run trying to trying to discover what you do. I need to be a little bit of a time policeman because we have 11 minutes and we have some extremely good questions from what I'm seeing. So I want to make sure that we measure our questions and then address those in the comments. So uh, one thing, we do this from time to time. You mentioned that you just hired a lot of data scientists that you're hiring. Is there perhaps a shout out to anybody from the audience who's uh, who's looking? Are you hiring data scientists right now? Anything like that that people watching this might want to apply for? Uh, we're constantly hiring. So um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, anybody on this call, you could go to um, our website or on LinkedIn and look at the jobs. There's a lot of hiring that we're looking to do on the on the tech side. Uh, development developers um, uh, in the product teams. Um, so there are uh, there are lots of a uh, lot of hiring that we need to do. Uh, you know we're we've in the growth phase, uh, growing. You know with with the last round that we announced, um, there is massive plans uh, growth plans across the board. So yeah, uh, including on the commercial side as well. Uh, but yeah, anybody who's you know please do look at our website or. Uh, or our LinkedIn pages and uh, look at the job opportunities and we'd be happy to talk. 
And whilst you're on the website, make sure to check out the acronym buster because it can help somebody like you, like me, to you know wrap my head around a little bit what's going on with all those acronyms and abbreviations. So I'm going to ask two questions, then I'm going to hand it over to the comments because these are slightly more technical than usual questions. So I guess they will warrant a longer explanation as well. Um, and these are the two questions that we always ask our guests. Number one is, what is your decision-making framework? Can be as broad, as specific as you want, but anything that helps you get through the day, like a rule of thumb, say, the simplest way to draw an example is cake. Is it good? Absolutely. Is it good for me? Mm, not sure. So could you give me something that works for you like that in your professional life when dealing with, uh, with uh, decisions concerning product as a head of product? It's a it's classic product, right? We, we, it's down to prioritization. Um, so uh, and and time management. If you're talking about a single day, um, you know what other other strategic things that I need to look at. Uh, what are the more tactical things that I need to address? Allocating you know time across those. And I, I'd say always going back to our uh, uh, you know long term view, having well defined you know metrics up front that this is the strategic goal. These are our North Star metrics or KPIs uh, through which we would, you know, gauge our performance uh, at the end of the year or at the end of the quarter. If you have that in mind and you, you know, weigh everything uh, with the lens of is it helping move that needle, uh, then I think the decisions become a lot uh, clearer and easier. Um, and and yeah, some decisions, you know, sometimes you may not have all the information, but some decisions are are not irreversible. So, you know, it, it's prudent to not spend too much time on them. Uh, if you can easily change gears down the road, then, you know, make, make a call, take any call based on your gut and move ahead. Uh, but there are other decisions that may be more required, more upfront diligence. So knowing, knowing, you know, which decision is what, it also helps save a lot of time. Uh, don't spend too much time on a decision that can easily be changed down the line. So a healthy dose of analysis paralysis, but not too much, essentially, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, and the second question that we ask is, I hand over to you the remote magic wand. You get to abracadabra it, and every 12-year-old on the planet is suddenly educated with, with what? You tell me. We've heard emotional intelligence, financial prudence, design thinking, systems thinking, all of those. And you can obviously say what I've just mentioned, one of those again, but I want you to make it yours. Why is it that you will choose what you will choose? Coding. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I did, did start as a, as a uh, software developer myself, but I, I think it's, uh, it's the language of the future. Uh, you know, we're not just talking about artificial intelligence, but, you know, machines would play a, play a bigger part. And, being able to talk to them, just like you know, we need to learn language to talk to humans. Um, if machines are going to do a lot of work and computers are going to do a lot of work, then we need to know the language to talk to them. Um, so yeah, I'd say every you know, I have an eight-year-old and um, she's learning basics of coding. But yeah, I would say every kid should uh, get on it early. Loving it. Absolutely loving it. Not not to say that, you know, just be a geek and be in front of your computer. <laughs> do everything else, have a balance, you know, do your outdoor physical activities and, and whatever is all of your interest. But it's it just like, you know, knowing new languages is a, or, or learning multiple languages, it helps, you know, your brain uh, develop. The same way, I think learning multiple or uh, learning coding language is another way to um, just have your brain uh, be more logical and uh, and whether you do become a coder or not, that's different. It just helps you think logically and critically, uh, which is a key benefit for the future. Absolutely, especially that it's a little bit like the product life cycle. You have the, the early adopters. At the end of the spectrum, you have laggards. So at some point, it's not even going to be, what is the benefit of me knowing a coding language or just the underlying logic under it. It's going to be, can I afford to not know that? Like as a doctor in five, 10 years, I think it's going to be much more difficult than just going through the years and years of studying of the anatomy. That might be actually reduced to something simpler because the machines around you might uh, give you a better idea of each bone, each muscle fiber and so on. But 
you will need to be able to interact with those things. So absolutely spot on. And now on to the comments. So uh, we have one from our own Kasha. And she asks about a cashless society. If there is no cash going around, if everything is digitized, KYC AML, does, is, is its existence still validated? Um, well, cashless means everything is digital, uh, which means uh, it's all the more relevant. Uh, you know, then, um, yeah, in a, in a, in a cash-based society, you don't really know who you're dealing with or what their background is other than you're just seeing their face. You walk into a store and they know nothing about you. But if it's all digital, then it becomes all the more uh, relevant um, and all the more doable, uh, you know, in, in that scenario. Uh, to be able to to know who you're dealing with, to do that full end-to-end -end tracking. Um, I, think, I think that's exactly Kasha's point, that it's so, like, if everything is digital, then you are cornered as the person who would want to do some money laundering. Will it be simply so well-connected? Like, if I am in a room and there's a camera and there's not a single blind spot, will I be committing crimes? Probably not. Well, um, I don't think like a criminal, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure people will, you know, there is money laundering that is happening through, or despite all the regulations that is going through, you know, banking rails and banking channels. So the key is that, you know, companies like us have to think one step ahead and be smarter than the criminals because, yeah, I'm sure they'll figure out ways. Uh, okay, here's to fighting the good fight. Uh uh, Raghavendra, hopefully that is not a mispronunciation on my part, says, great explanation on KYC and AML in this sector from you. We drive fraud areas in advanced analytics. How far is the change from rules to advanced machine learning on going in industry and clients and the use of such techniques by Comply Advantage? Um, obviously, the, the usage is more developed in the fraud uh, scenario. Uh, you know, uh, in in say AML, uh, it's it's been historically it's been very much static rules based uh, approach, uh, but uh, the switch to machine learning and and usage of AI is the need of the hour. We are actively working on it. We have uh, you know a lot of innovation going uh, in the company uh, uh, to uh, to you know do something that that's been done in fraud already. And like I was saying, there's a challenge because unlike fraud, you don't have as much insight with with AML. You don't know for sure, um, so it's it's going to be it's going to look slightly different. Uh, but it's a key part of our uh, strategy, um, and that's how we're looking to differentiate ourselves from uh, some of the other players. Solid one. Uh, I just want to ask because we are allegedly one or two minutes away from the time where we usually end, but we have three questions from an avid question asker, and I think that you will like them. So is it okay with you if we run over slightly the hour? Sure. Okay, so question one out of three from Marcin. Marcin, thank you so much for participating in the, in the, in the live stream. Mm -hmm. He says that we already have market solutions like NetReveal or Actimize, shout out to those names mentioned here, that are using AI to el eliminate false positives or the need for manual work. And though those solutions are created for big financial industries, are you as Comply Advantage focusing on perhaps the smaller players that don't have the budget or the infrastructure warranting the solutions that were just mentioned? Two, two things I would say to that. Uh, one, yeah, the companies you mentioned, they are uh, using AI. Despite that, there is a gap in the market. So there's always room for um, enhancing or improving the application of the technology. So we close in, close in on those gaps uh, for, the, for the larger players, you know, the big financial uh, industries. But yeah, to your point around the smaller players, uh, absolutely, as... Uh, you know, as uh, Comply Advantage, our target customers are, um, a lot of them tend to be in that um, tier two or fintech space, um, startup or scale up phase. And we absolutely want to keep them uh, included by offering, uh, you know, affordable solutions for, for them as well. Um, in fact, we, we recently launched um, something called Comply Launch, 
which is uh, essentially a free uh, free version of our offering uh, for new startups um, and uh, that's getting a lot of traction so any any new company you know that's just wanting to get off the road they shouldn't have to spend a whole bunch of money or worry about how they uh, comply with regulation or uh, you know so we are offering our solution for free uh, to help them get started and then uh, you know they can grow as as they grow they can get the more sophisticated version um, but yeah we we want to target all players the smaller players uh, tier 2 tier 3 companies two out of three from margin Taking under consideration that you will gather information in local sources, how can you be certain that collected data is not quote unquote fake news or a name coincidence? Did you consider validating sources or creating a valid source list of data first? Something that we slightly touched upon, but I think like I feel that Martin's question is slightly more elaborate than what I asked. Um, yeah, I don't think I'll be able to give you an elaborate answer uh, answer in, in this call right now. But yeah, to your point, those are the challenges. When we first uh, came out with the solution, we realized that these are some things that we need to solve for. Um, and those are constantly, you know, the, the, the KPIs through which we measure the performance of those teams, they, they are uh, measured on, on, on these things, how to reduce the instances of name coincidence or fake news. Uh, you know, or sometimes we we see age mismatch, but you know, some news could be uh, from two years ago, another news, you know, from today. Um, so how do we how do we solve for these things? That's I can't give you anything more than that today in this call. But uh, yeah, those are challenges that we are we are facing and constantly looking to solve. And now on to the last one from Marcin. And I think this requires a little bit of gymnastics from you as to not uh, not, not say too much. But Marcin states that there are fines paid by financial institutions. And in your opinion, were they caused by a genuine lack of knowledge, technical support for AML, or silence allowance? I'm not sure what the last one means. I'm, I, gut feel tells me that it's something like don't ask, don't tell approach. But uh, yeah, the question, the question goes to you. We've seen examples ac across the board, uh, right? Sometimes it's a mix of these um, or different um, fines focus on, say, one of these. But it, 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 they are focused, focused on, uh, uh, I won't say lack of intent, but, uh, uh, but not having the, the right... Uh, tools, or sometimes you know the right, um, or, or sometimes the right focus. Um, so maybe you do have the tools, but you're not, uh, you know, tuning uh, them appropriately, or don't have uh, the timely access to to data to information. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's it's um, it's it's down to the tools and the timeliness of how you're using the tools, um, and and. For the legacy, um, you know, for the larger um, institutions, uh, it's not it's not necessarily the the intent, but it's just being bogged down by uh, by you know legacy infrastructure. So even if they they want to move faster, sometimes they they get held back, um, and it's it's a function of just not just infrastructure, but that could be uh, 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 you know just resistance to change as well. So there could be a human element there also. Just being, uh, I'd say. There is there is a, a need to be more open minded and uh, be open to trying out uh, you know different solutions um, than looking to do uh, things in house because that's that's a slow process and there's enough evidence to show that it hasn't worked even for the larger larger financial institutions. So, uh, Marcin, uh, thanks for all the questions. And just like you heard on the last one, the horse would like to pull the cart really fast, but the cart was just not designed to go that quick. So, uh, hope that answers your question. And, Arshi, thank you so much for today. I uh, I really enjoyed it. I hope you did as well. Um, and uh, to everybody else uh, that is watching this episode, we will be seeing you next week, hopefully, on the next episode of Disruption Talks. We're going to be talking about Buy Now, Pay Later with the CEO and founder of Zilch. So stay tuned. You'll be seeing posts all over your LinkedIn uh, timeline, hopefully, from us. And uh, we're hoping that you will come. And Arshi, once again, thank you so much. 
it was a blast and i am at least 20 times smarter than i was 65 minutes ago so thank you so much thanks thanks for having me thank you philip absolutely so like you heard thanks everyone and see you next week bye bye